Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall he lead. Till every foe is vanquished, and Christ is born in gain. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, the trumpet call of you're here this morning let's everyone stand this morning we're going to sing a chorus keep walking with the lord if you don't know it we'll try to sing it a couple times through this morning keep walking with the lord every day this morning, Stepping in the Light, page 313. Cans with someone near you, especially for our guest on the last verse. For Great to see you here at Mansfield Baptist Temple today. Thank you for attending. Let's begin our service with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your blessings on our lives, Lord. Thank you for beautiful sunshine and the weather that you've provided, Lord. Thank you for each one who's made the effort to be in your house today, Lord. And for those who are going to be tuning in 
by means of the radio broadcast soon, Lord. I pray your hand of blessing upon each. We ask you to meet with us today, Lord, and we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. If you would, at this time, take your bulletin out, and inside your bulletin, you're going to see what's called a connection card. That connection card is an opportunity for us to connect with you. If you are a regular attender, if you just put your name, your email, and then maybe if you're signing up for something. If you are visiting with us, if this is your first time here, we are asking you to put as much information as you feel comfortable with putting on this connection card. You can drop it in the offering. You can drop it off out at the Welcome Center after the service. But we have a book. The book is titled Done, and that is our gift to you, thanking you for being in our service today. And we hope that you enjoy worshiping with us. You are our honored guest, and it's our joy to have you here. Our choir is going to sing at this time a praise medley. Our hymnal, page 261, if you need this morning, page 261, Trust and Obey.
we prepare for our offering, let me give you a couple of announcements, some things so you can see a little bit more about in your bulletin. But uh, uh, this evening, our teens are doing uh, what we call a teen takeover service, and our teens are going to be in charge of the, every aspect of our service. So we're looking forward to that tonight, 630. If you're able to be here, I think you'll enjoy that. Tomorrow morning, our uh, Temple Christian School opens up 9 a.m. with an orientation tomorrow. And uh, so pray for our school. And we've talked a little bit about our Adopt-A-Student program. If you would have the capability of helping a student attend the school, I know there are some students who are coming in and uh, don't have the finances they need and are hoping that uh, the Lord answers some prayer, and you may be the answer to that prayer. So if you'd be able to help out in any way, maybe it's a portion of a year or for a student or a number of students, uh, we'd like to talk to you and, and show you our Adopt-A-Student brochure. And then uh, we want to congratulate our soccer team. See a little trophy up here. Our soccer team went up to Michigan over the weekend, and they won a soccer tournament. Jacob McClellan was our MVP of the, of the tournament. So uh, praise the Lord for that. A couple activities that are coming up. September the 8th, in the evening service, is going to be Harmony House Help Evening. And uh, we're looking to, to just do some things to help out the Harmony House. It's a homeless shelter here in town on 3rd Street. And so uh, we'll have some things in the bulletin here in the next couple of weeks, items that you can donate uh, toward that. And so we look forward to that. The next Sunday evening, September the 15th, mark your calendar, Sunday evening church that night starts at 5.30 instead of 6.30, 5.30 service. And we are going to be recognizing, honoring everyone who has gotten saved, baptized, joined our church in the last year. Special song to start the service you will not want to miss. And uh, after the service, we're going to have some food and fellowship and fun. So mark your calendars for Rejoice Sunday evening, September the 15th. The Harvest Rally is coming up. Uh, Brother Baird's going to be looking for some help with that Harvest Rally. If you're not familiar with that, that's a teen activity where a lot of teens come from around the state, out of state even. Uh, we have a special speaker coming. They do a lot of fun games over here at Beale Road at our property there. And some challenges from God's Word to our young people. So... That is September the 14th. September the 7th is a work day. September the 4th, Wednesday night after church, there's a meeting for everyone that's going to be part of that. There's some information about a, a topper's activity, sight and sound, in your bulletin. And there is a meeting after the service tonight. If you are interested in any way of that trip, uh, there will be a meeting right after church tonight. A few prayer requests for you then. Pray for Sandra Chenier. She is having a port put in tomorrow, and then she has a treatment coming up Friday. Pray for Jim Kraft. They found a, a lymph node that's uh, enlarged, and he goes to see a surgeon on Wednesday to see what they should do about that. Pray for Elaine Folger. She's been struggling with a uh, fracture in her spine, and they're trying to figure out what, what approach to take there. So pray for her if you would as well. For those who have just joined us, by means of our radio broadcast, it's good to have you listening in, WMAN, uh, every Sunday morning, 1115 to 12. And so we hope you'll stay with us for the remainder of our service today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer for our offering. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your blessings on our life. We thank you for our opportunity to meet in your house. Lord, we thank you for our opportunity to carry your word and to study from it, Lord, to sing praises to you the way our choir did. Lord, we thank you for our opportunity to give back a portion of what you've given to us, Lord, in our offerings. And we ask for your blessing upon our offering today. In Jesus' name, amen.
This morning, uh, we have Grace Custer to come sing for us. And I have to admit, this is one of my favorite songs this morning. It's entitled, Written in Red. stand once again this morning uh, as we sing page number 372 who is on the Lord's side page number 372 
so much. Just before Pastor comes this morning, we have Michelle and Crystal McClure to come sing for us. Seekers of your heart. Matthew chapter 11, Matthew chapter 11, what a beautiful song, Seekers of Your Heart. We are thankful that you are here today. Those listening by means of our radio broadcast, appreciate you listening in. We have been going through the Gospels, just studying the life of Christ. We titled this series, Teaching That Transforms. I want to begin reading in the first verse. I'm going to read six verses from Matthew chapter 11. If you have a a bulletin in your bulletin, you'll see that initial passage of Scripture as well as a possibility to take some notes if that would be helpful to you. Matthew chapter 11, beginning in verse 1, says, And it came to pass, when Jesus had made an end of commanding his twelve disciples, he departed thence to teach and to preach in their cities. Now when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Art thou he that should come? Or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which ye do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we open your scripture now, We need you to meet with us, Lord, to help us to understand what you have for us here, to rightly divide your word, Lord, to make application where it's due. We want you to be pleased, Lord, when we conclude today. So we ask for your help in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I would never do this, but I'm sure some of you probably would make this mistake. 
I say that tongue-in-cheek. For those who have children, maybe some of you have had children a long time ago. You have to think back of this, but for those of us who have children now, sometimes you may send your child to someone else's house, and you pray something like this, Lord, please help my child to behave. Please help my child not to say anything stupid. Please help my child not to say how I lost it last night. Please help my child not to tell about the faults in our house. Whatever. Does anyone else pray like my wife and I do sometimes? You say, I, I just hope, I hope my child puts, puts his, his or her best foot forward. I just hope they don't share our faults. I, just, I hope they, they appear to be with it. When you open your Bible here, you might have a question about what you read. You see, there's a question in here that might be a little bit shocking to you. Questions are generally good. I was a school teacher once upon a time, and maybe I took a little bit of a weird approach, but I'd get up in front of my class and I'd say, now listen to me. You ask questions. Do you hear me? I want you to ask questions. If you don't, I'm going to be mad. It's going to tick me off if you don't ask questions. And, we, and we, we solicit questions. We want them to ask. But then every once in a while, you get one of those questions like, oh, boy. Wish you wouldn't have asked that one. We come upon a question here, and it's a little bit shocking. You see, the questions found in verse 3 of our passage, if you'll look there, you see this is the question. Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Now, if you haven't read your Bible much and you don't know much about it, you might just buzz right through here and it might not be much to you. But as you begin to study this passage of Scripture, you should say, Whoa! Did I just hear what I think I heard? Was that John the Baptist asking that question to Christ? Did John the Baptist ask that? Was that John the Baptist? You see, if you know a little bit about John the Baptist, you would see that this question might be a little bit of a surprising question. John the Baptist... What we read of is a man who's in prison, and he asks a question. He sends two of his disciples or his followers, and he says, Hey, go ask Jesus, art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Now, let's do a little bit of research here. John the Baptist asked that? John the Baptist, he's the guy who baptized Jesus. John the Baptist He's the voice of one crying in the wilderness. He was the guy that went out in the wilderness. He was dressed in a little bit of a funny way, and he ate some weird stuff, and he preached. He was committed to the work. In Luke chapter 3, we learn a little bit about him. John the Baptist was the one that looked at the religious leaders of that day, and he said, oh, generation of vipers. That was John the Baptist. He was not only committed to the work, he was combative to religious pride. John the Baptist. One of my favorite passages in the scriptures, John chapter 1, verses 29, when John the Baptist looked at Jesus, he says, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. The next day after, the Bible says in John 1, 35, he was there with a couple of his disciples and he just said, Behold the Lamb of God. Immediately, those two guys just went and started following Jesus. John the Baptist. John the Baptist is the guy in John chapter 3 who said, He must increase, but I must decrease. That was John the Baptist. That guy. But now he's in prison, and he asks a question. It's a little bit of a surprising question coming from that guy. He sends his disciples to Jesus, and he basically says, Hey, ask him, are you the guy? Are we waiting on somebody else? What's going on? 
Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Did that question come from that, John? It seems as though circumstances in the life of John the Baptist seem to create some doubt and some discouragement. It may be that John the Baptist, who was doing all these things for the Lord, things in his life weren't working out quite the way he wanted, and he ends up in prison. And he begins to doubt a little bit. And he says, hey, I know I baptized you. And I know I pointed a lot of others to you. And I know I was the voice of one crying in the woods. I know I said he must increase, but I must decrease. But are you the guy? Are we looking for somebody else? A surprising question. But let's take a look at the response that Jesus gave. A straightforward answer. Here's what Jesus said. Report on what you see. Look what it says in in verse 4. Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which ye do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. What's Jesus saying to him there? How is Jesus responding to him? It's a pretty straightforward answer. He says, hey, just go back and tell him what you get to see and hear. Now, one thing Jesus was doing there, I believe, for John the Baptist, if you'll take your Bible and go over to Luke chapter 4, you'll see what I mean. Luke chapter 4, in this passage, Jesus comes into the synagogue And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah, or Isaiah, in verse 17. Luke 4, 17 says, Jesus came in, there was given to him the book of the prophet Isaiah, and when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. So Jesus took the book of Isaiah, and he went to a certain spot, and he began to read out of it. And here's what he read. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. You see what was happening here? In Luke chapter 4, Jesus shows up in the synagogue. He takes a prophetic book from years ago, and he opens it up to exactly to the right spot, and he reads from it. And he's reading prophecy... And a little bit later here in Luke chapter 4, he says, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. He said that prophecy about the Messiah is coming to pass now. I am the Messiah. So when he responds to John in Matthew chapter 11, he says, hey, tell him what's going on here. Here's what we're seeing. It's exactly the way things were prophesied. It's fulfilled prophecy. But he says to him, he says, just report on what you see and hear. The works of the Savior revealed that he was the Messiah. The works of the Savior revealed that he was the Messiah. May I ask you this question? Does what's happened in your life through the Messiah reveal that he's the Messiah? You've heard before that the best advertisement is a quality product, right? The best advertisement is a quality product. You ever want to go out and you want to to tell someone about Christ? Can I give you some advice on how to go out and do that? One way to do it, just tell what he's done in your life. Just tell of the change in your life. Let them know what's happened in your life. Report on what's happening in your life. Jesus said, hey, just look around. When someone comes into this church, they ought to be able to look around. They might be able to say, hey, look at that guy. I remember him 10 years ago. I remember him 20 years ago. I remember him a year ago. Wow, something's happened there. He must have found the Messiah. His life must have been changed by Jesus Christ. You know, sometimes people say this about church. Well, I'm not going to church because there's hypocrites there. You know, a good way to respond to that is, Good! 
That's a great spot for them. Isn't that a good way to respond? That's a great spot for the hypocrite because just maybe they'll be challenged by the word of God to live as they ought. If you go to the local grocery store, bad news for you, there's probably hypocrites in there. And guess what? They're probably not going to be challenged about being hypocritical there. You don't normally see the the lady at the cash register say, hey, I need to talk to you before I check you out. I noticed your car. It's a BMW. Your clothes, designer. But you're buying. That's not the name brand. Go on over to lane three. Maybe they'll take you. You're not going to get that there, are you? You're going to find that in the house of God, I hope. I hope you're going to be challenged about that. Report on what you see, Jesus said. Report on the things that are happening. A surprising question, a straightforward answer. But then he gives a sure blessing. You see, he he says this to these guys. He says, go back to John. Go and show John again the things that you do hear and see. And he names them. But then he gives a second half to that answer. Look in verse 6 at what he says. He says, and blessed is he, whosoever shall not be offended in me. He says, I want to give you a sure blessing. You pass this on to John. He needs to hear this. A sure blessing. You know, there's some things in life. Sometimes someone will come to you and say, hey, I got it. I got an investment. I got a way for you to make money. I'll tell you what, if you stick your money in that machine and you pull down that lever... Boy, you might make a bunch of money. If you go buy that ticket, $480 million might be in your hand. Which, by the way, both of those things are anti-biblical, I believe. But someone may even say, I got an investment for you. If you take this investment, it may work out. It may not. Been there, done that. But what if Jesus says, I got a way for you to have a blessing. In your notes, I put it this way. Jesus provides a blessing that is absolutely guaranteed. Wouldn't it behoove us then to say, I want to take the word of God, and I want to find where Jesus says I'm going to be blessed. I want to take the route where Jesus says I'm going to be blessed. I want the blessing of Christ because it's absolutely guaranteed. Can I tell you something? If you're listening by means of our radio broadcast, if you're sitting here today, it may be you're new to church. You don't know much about the word of God. Let me tell you about one blessing that he will give you absolutely guaranteed. Young people, listen up. Those that are a little later in life, listen up. The Bible teaches us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says, as it is written... There is none righteous, no, not one. The Bible says because of our sin, we're eternally separated from God. It's impossible for us to reach God on our own. And then the Bible says we've got a blessing for you. It's the gift of eternal life. It is yours absolutely guaranteed. All you do is put your faith and trust in what Jesus Christ has done for you. By faith. You accept the gift of eternal life. It is a blessing absolutely guaranteed by the Lord. Here, Jesus says, Blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. You understand here, he's, re- he's sending that message back to John. John is a man who took a stand for the Lord, and he got thrown in prison for it. As a matter of fact, a little later on, he's going to get his head cut off for it. And here's what Jesus said. You stand for me. You stand for me and you will be blessed. I don't know what it was like that day he got his head cut off. But I know this, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And he went straight to heaven. And I bet you that was an amazing reunion when that happened. Blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. Take a stand. Make a determination. You're not going to allow things. This is what John could have said. 
in prison. He could have said, I don't care anymore. I tried to do right. It just didn't work out for me. Jesus said, oh, don't let that happen. Don't let that happen. Blessed is he who shall not, whosoever shall not be offended in me. A sure blessing. But I, I show you a forethought. I love this one. I titled this one, A Strong Encouragement. You see, after John the Baptist asked that question to Jesus, boy, Jesus had an opportunity to really get after him. I mean, he could have really put him in his place. He could have chastised him. He could have chastened him. He could have verbally abused him and said, you shouldn't have questioned me ever. But that's not the approach of our Lord. Look what it says in verse 7. It says, And and as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, What went ye out into the wilderness to see a reed shaken with the wind? But what went ye out for to see a man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in kings' houses. But what went ye out for to see a prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet, for this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Verily, I say unto you, look at verse 11, Jesus speaking. Among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. You know, when you open your Bible and you begin to look in it, you're going to read about a guy named Abraham. If you go to James chapter 2, Abraham was referred to as a friend of God. But when you read about Abraham, you're also going to read about a time in his life where he tried to deceive, he lied. It's in the Bible. There's a guy in the Bible named Moses. Moses in Numbers chapter 12 was called the meekest man on the earth. But if you read about Moses, there was a time in his life where he lost it. He lost his temper and did what he shouldn't have done. There's another man in the Bible, his name's David. The Bible tells in Acts chapter 13, God referred to him in this way, a man after mine own heart. David, a man after God's own heart. Boy, David made some serious mistakes in the scripture. There's another guy in the Bible, his name's Solomon. In 1 Kings chapter 3, it tells us that Solomon was the wisest man ever to live. But if you study his life, He let some women lead him astray, and he went into idolatry, made a mess. Matthew chapter 11, there's a guy named John. He's struggling a little bit. He's questioning a little bit. He's doubting a little bit. He's discouraged. So he sends a couple of his disciples from prison where he was, and he says, Go go ask Jesus. Are, Are you the guy? We looking for someone else. Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Boy, Jesus could have pounced on that, couldn't he? I can't believe you, John the Baptist. How would you do that? Aren't you glad this passage is in the Scripture? Boy, I sure am glad this is in the Scripture. Because sometimes we struggle a little bit, don't we? But you know what? Jesus was presented with an opportunity to vilify, to belittle, to criticize. If your picture of Christ is he's the town bully, if your picture of Christ is is he's a cantankerous old man, if your picture of Christ is he desires to condemn, he wants to send people to a place called hell, That's not the Christ of the Bible. The Christ of the Bible, when this guy was struggling a little bit, he goes, that guy is the greatest man ever to be born of a woman. Jesus chose to encourage, to exhort, to edify, to build him up a little bit, to build him up. You may be going through some difficulty in your life. You say, boy, I'm just going through a tough time. I've been doubting a little bit. I've been discouraged a little bit. Run to Jesus. Run to Jesus. 
He wants to pick you up. He wants to encourage you. As a matter of fact, at the end of this chapter, he says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart. You shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Don't you like the strong encouragement he gave to John there? But when this question came to Christ... And he responded to it. He then turned to the multitudes and he says, this is a teaching point. This is a time to teach. Let me share a little bit with you that I think can be a help to you. And he finished with what I call a savvy saying. A savvy saying. Look at the end of verse 19 when he says this. Wisdom is justified of her children. Wisdom is justified of... Of her children. Jesus is going to make a point here, and then he's going to tie it all together with this thought wisdom is justified of her children. Now let's read here, beginning in verse 12. Look at the 12th verse of Matthew 11. It says, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence. And the violent take it by force. For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John. And if ye will receive it, this is Elias, which was for to come. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. But whereunto shall I liken this generation? It is like unto children sitting in the markets and calling unto their fellows and saying, We have piped unto you and ye have not danced. We have mourned unto you and ye have not lamented. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He hath a devil. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a man gluttonous and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. But wisdom is justified of her children. Now, what are we learning here? What does he mean when he tells us all this? And then he says, Wisdom is is justified of her children. Look back at verse 12. It may be you're like me and you read verse 12 and you say, what? What does that mean? And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and the violent take it by force. Now there's a couple of thoughts here. One is it may be that Jesus is saying, hey, there are those that are contentious with what's going on. Since John the Baptist started preaching and said things like, Oh, generation of vipers, who shall prepare thee for the wrath to come? Since John started that till now, there's there's some contention there. That could be part of it. But what does he mean when he says, The kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force? When it says suffereth violence there, it means to be seized. And then the word violent can be defined as energetic. Now think about this. When he says, and from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence or has been seized, and the violent or the energetic take it by force. Here's what he could be saying. He says, hey, since John the Baptist started, there are those who are energetically seizing on to the gift of eternal life. They're recognizing the kingdom of heaven as a hand. They're excited about it. But then he goes on, and he says in verse 16, he says, But whereunto shall I liken this generation? It is like unto children sitting in the markets and calling unto their fellows, and saying, We have piped unto you, and ye have not danced. We have mourned unto you, and ye have not lamented. John came, and you didn't like the way he came. And Jesus came, and you didn't like the way he came. But wisdom's justified over children. I think Jesus is saying this in this passage of Scripture. He says, there are some who have greedily caught it and embraced it, excited about it. But then there are others that are listening to me today. And you are unmoved, even cynical. It's like when children say, hey, let's go have fun. And you say, I don't want to have fun. And you say, well, let's go over here and mourn. And they say, I don't want to do that either. I'm not doing either. 
I'm not budging. He said, some, some are like that. Then he says, but wisdom is justified of her children. In your notes, I put it this way. The product will vindicate the approach. The product will justify the approach. Wise children reveal wisdom in their parents. Would you agree with that? You see a young person who's growing up, you say, well, that's, that's, a young person has some wisdom. Well, that probably is an indication that their parents shared some wisdom with them. Followers of Christ indicate that he is the Messiah, the Savior. Followers of Christ indicate that Jesus is the Messiah, the Savior. We have a role, we have an obligation, we should be showing others that Jesus is the Messiah. Wisdom is justified of her children. There was a president who once made this statement. He said, a victory has a thousand fathers, and defeat is an orphan. A victory has a thousand fathers, and defeat is an orphan. And what he was saying was, if there's a victory, everybody says, I was part of that. I produced that. If there's a defeat, that one's an orphan. Nobody's claiming that one. When Jesus said wisdom is justified of her children, he says, hey, wisdom is going to be seen in the result. What Jesus says is when you see changed lives, that's when you know that we found the Messiah. You will be known by your changed life. You and I can see a tree outside in uh, April. In April of uh, this next year, you and I can see a tree outside and we can argue to death over, that's an apple tree. No, I think it's a pear tree. That's an apple tree. But come summertime, we're going to figure it out, right? It's either going to come, it's not going to have both. We're going to find out. You know what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 20? He said, wherefore by their fruits ye shall know them. By their fruits ye shall know them. Sometimes someone will make a profession of faith in Christ and there's nothing there. I don't know their heart, but I know one thing. The Bible says, by their fruits you shall know them. Jesus said, wisdom is justified of her children. John the Baptist, he was having a time of doubt and discouragement. Yeah, that's what it looks like. Jesus said, hey, just report on what you're seeing. And remember this, blessed is he whosoever is not offended in me. Can I tell you this? The day will come when the product will justify the approach. That day's coming. It may be when you pass away. It may be when the Lord comes. But the product's going to justify the approach. The Bible gives us the direction to go. It's up to us whether or not we're going to accept it. If we do, wisdom will be just, or will be, um, wisdom will be justified of her children. Wisdom will be justified of her children. When the Bible says we're all sinners, and because of our sin, we deserve a place in hell, but Christ died so we don't have to go there, and we trust Christ as our Savior. Wisdom will be justified over children. There will come a day and you'll say, now I understand. Now I see. Now I recognize the wisdom of taking the approach of this word. I don't know what decision you may need to make today. It may be that you need to trust Christ as your Savior. It may need to be that you say, I know I've trusted Christ as my Savior. I know I'm on my way to heaven. The next step for me is to be baptized Why not make that decision today? It may be you say, I need to join the church. Whatever it may be, I need to put my life in accord with this word because wisdom is justified of her children. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful that Matthew chapter 11 is in the word of God. I'm thankful that that guy struggled a little bit. Jesus helped him out, encouraged him a little bit. He desires to do the same for you and for me. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer.